Uh, I think you don't need uh, an introduction for, uh, for Peter Singer. Everybody knows that he's the author of Animal Liberation and, and Practical Ethics, which is listed among the 100 most important philosophy books. What you might not know is he's uh, now updating uh, Animal Liberation. So uh, something like 25 or so uh, translations are going to have to be uh, updated as well. And uh, you might not know also about uh, the prize that uh, he received uh, last year, the Bergurin Prize of uh, $1 million uh, that uh, he has donated, in addition to the various millions that his charity, The Life You Can Save, uh, has uh, donated. So it's a great honor to have him here, as well as a massive inspiration. Whenever you want, Peter. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Paola, for having organized this event and uh, made it possible for me to come to uh, Barcelona to speak and uh, all of the others who are involved in organizing this. I know that these events don't just happen by themselves. They, they take a lot of hard work. Uh, so um, I want to talk uh, about some of the background to the Great Ape Project. I thought you've, you've uh, seen the film um, about some of the recent results of the Great Ape Project, which is uh, exciting to see those changes really happening to particular animals, to Sandra and Cecilia. Um, what I would like to do is to say a little bit about uh, how the idea of the Great Ape Project came about, uh, what it was trying to do, um, and uh, something about what has happened since then. Um, but I know that uh, Paola and Macarena will be talking more about some of the details of recent developments, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I'd like to go back to give you the context to um, 1975 when I published Animal Liberation, which, um, of course, was arguing for uh, a change in our ethics for all animals, or more specifically, for all sentient beings, for all beings capable of suffering, capable of experiencing pleasure or pain, um, and uh, arguing that if a being is capable of suffering, then that suffering should receive equal consideration with any other being, assuming that we're talking about similar amounts, as far as we can roughly compare them, similar amounts of pain or similar amounts of suffering of other kinds, uh, the argument of the book is that the fact that the being is not a member of our species is not in itself a reason for either ignoring altogether or discounting the um, the significance of the, the pain, or for that matter, the pleasure or happiness, um, the interests of the animal in general, the interests of a being, are not dependent on its species. Um, and to make that point, uh, I use the term speciesism, which uh, I did not invent, but which I took from Richard Ryder, who um, uh, had written a leaflet about the uh, about experiments on, on chimpanzees, um, in which uh, the heading of that leaflet was speciesism, and it showed a very sad photograph of a chimpanzee who had been infected with syphilis in order to try and study syphilis and learn something about it or benefit humans in some way. Of course, we, we know that there were um, shocking unethical experiments performed on uh, blacks in the American South also with syphilis, so um, the, the parallel with that particular experiment on, on a chimpanzee um, and the racism that enabled these experiments to be performed on, on blacks in, in the American South when they would never have been performed on whites, um, I think was a very nice illustration of the closeness of racism and speciesism in terms of the impact that it has on, on the victims without the proper consideration of the interests of the victims in either case. Uh, and that was the point of, of the, the term speciesism, to make that parallel between racism and sexism, for example, and uh, also the way 
we treat animals. Um, in the book, I, I did write about experiments on animals, um, but not particularly about experiments on chimpanzees or other great apes, um, just on, on animals in general. And I also had a, a long chapter on uh, the, the use of animals to ra raising them for food, and particularly on factory farming. Um, and the book had some impact over the, the years that followed, in particular, uh, more radical animal organizations sprung up. Uh, for example, PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Um, Ingrid Newkirk, the founder, has said that she was inspired by the book. And uh, Animal Liberation in Australia, when I, I, when I was writing the book, I was in uh, partly in Oxford and then later in New York. But I went back to Australia around the time it was published um, and helped to establish an animal liberation organization there. Um, and, and there were uh, changes that started happening. Um, Henry Spearer in the United States uh, formed a coalition against the uh, Dray's test, the test uh, the Revlon and other cosmetics companies were using uh, that blinded rabbits to uh, test the safety of their products. Um, and, and a number of things started happening in the late 70s and early 1980s, um, and it looked like some progress was being made. But um, by the end of the 1980s and the early 1990s, um, that progress seemed to have, to some extent, become you know, plateaued or didn't seem to be making as much progress um, at that time. Uh, and um, in particular, the movement on in terms of farmed animals, which was uh, by far the largest number of animals that humans were inflicting suffering on, um, had uh, turned into kind of incremental reforms rather than uh, a movement with a radical idea of completely changing the status of animals or you know, having a different attitude to animals or bringing them inside the uh, moral circle, inside the, the sphere of uh, equal consideration of interest. Um, instead, the movement was trying to do things like uh, prohibit cages for laying hens um, or uh, the narrow stalls that both veal calves and uh, sows, the, the, the breeding sows, uh, the mothers of pigs who were being sent to market for their meat, um, that they were kept in. Um, and, um, you know, that, that was, uh, on the one hand, that was important work because it did reduce the suffering of these animals, undoubtedly, um, and very large numbers of animals. You're talking about hundreds of millions of animals. Um, but on the other hand, it, it seemed to be like moving back to the idea that it's it's okay for us to use animals, it's okay for us to raise animals for food, we just have to do it in a kinder way. Um, so, you know, there was an alternative slogan, I had this various, the various debates going on, people like Tom Regan, who wrote the case for animal rights, was saying, um, you know, we don't want larger cages, we want empty cages, um, and of course I sympathised with that, but politically it really didn't seem possible to, um, to have empty cages, i.e. to abolish cages and, and, and to abolish the commercial production of animals for meat or eggs or dairy um, just seemed completely unrealistic. And to some extent, of course, that's still true, unfortunately, despite the very welcome growth in uh, plant-based eating and, and vegan products that, that has made that just a little bit more feasible. But um, so going back to, say, around 1990, when um, the movement didn't seem to be pushing really for this kind of dramatic change in the status of animals, um, Paolo Cavalieri, who is an, 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 uh, an Italian animal activist uh, who I'd met because she invited me to speak in, in Italy on a couple of occasions, um, said to me that she was thinking of trying to do something specifically for chimpanzees that um, she thought that maybe in the case of chimpanzees, we could have the kind of radical change that animal liberation had been arguing for, but that was polit politically too difficult because of the huge interests involved in continuing to produce, and for that matter, from the public, consume animals. Um, 
So she wanted to do, she was uh, e editing a, a journal called Etica e Animali, um, and she wanted to do a special issue of, of the journal um, on chimpanzees, and uh, wanted me to join uh, to invite various well-known people to contribute to that, um, and to join her in writing something about it as well. So that was really the, the first uh, idea that uh, eventually led to the Great Ape Project. Um, I, a couple of things changed. One is that I suggested that rather than do it as a special issue of this uh, rather small Italian animal and ethics journal, which had, uh, it would be possible if you could get the right authors for it, um, it would be possible to do it as a book for a much wider audience. Um, and that did happen because uh, we wrote to many well-known people, starting with Jane Goodall, uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, a couple of the people that you saw in the, in the film, uh, Lynn White Miles uh, with Chantek the Orangutan and Francine Patterson with uh, Coco, um, and, uh, and, and a, range of, a range of experts both on chimpanzees, um, sorry, both yeah, on, on chimpanzees and, and uh, not only the facts about them and their behaviour, but also philosophers and others who were working on relevant issues. One of the people who we did write to, Richard Dawkins, wrote back and said, yeah, you know, this is an interesting project and I'm willing to write for you, but um, why are you limi limit limiting it to chimpanzees? Because if we're talking about things like, uh, you know, the cognitive capacities, the rationality and so on, um, there isn't really much difference between chimpanzees and the other great apes, uh, gorillas and uh, orangutans. Um, and uh, at that stage, by the way, we weren't really thinking of bonobos as a separate species. That only became clear later, so uh, they, they came into it afterwards. So we talked about that and we decided that was uh, a good idea and we were able to therefore broaden it and that's how it became the Great Ape Project rather than the Chimpanzee Project. But the underlying uh, philosophical idea here, I suppose, as well as a, a sort of tactical idea to change things was to that because with the great apes there isn't this vast industry that um, produces them uh, as cheaply as possible and then kills them and there isn't this huge public which um, eats them and wants to think about, oh, what would I eat if I stopped eating meat, um, that it would be easier to take a radical stance on behalf of this narrower group of animals. Uh, and therefore the idea of... Um, expanding the circle beyond our own species could at least be achieved in this limiting way, limited way of expanding the circle to uh, a larger group of beings, um, including all of the great apes. It wasn't that we ever really wanted to stop at that point. I think we, uh, Paula and I, were always conscious of the idea that the great apes could be a bridge to um, other animals as well in the longer term. So uh, we were thinking of the fact that in human thinking, there are humans on the one hand and then there's just animals on the other hand. Uh, and of course, that's already false to start with because we know that humans are animals, as again was, was shown in the film. Um, but um, it's also really, absurd when you think that um, the differences uh, among those who are animals, as zoologists would classify them, uh, the differences from chimpanzees or from us to uh, earthworms, let's say, um, are so much vastly greater than the differences between us and chimpanzees or the other great apes. So uh, we were trying to break down that kind of uh, dualism in our thought between humans and animals um, and get people to recognise that, no, um, there's not uh, a gulf between us, there's a continuum. Um, and once you get people to be thinking of that continuum, then, of course, the question will be, so how wide do we go? And people will be, will be able to start thinking about that in a different way. So that was um, a part of the point, that this would be a, an easier target to try to achieve change with. And the other part of it was that in terms of the arguments that uh, 
you engaged in once you started talking about equal consideration of interests for um, all sentient beings, you immediately got the argument that, um, well, you know, we're rational and they're not, or we're self-conscious and they're not, or we're autonomous and they're not, uh, or we use language uh, and they don't. Um, and that's a, uh, an old argument. Uh, famously, Jeremy Bentham already raised that in the late 18th century um, when he said, you know, uh, what's, what draws the line between us and non-human animals? Um, is, it that, uh, is it the capacity to reason or the capacity to talk? Um, and said, no, it's the capacity to suffer. Um, but that argument keeps coming back at you. Um, and one of the other benefits of talking about the great apes is that you can quite clearly say, well, there is a capacity to reason, um, there is a capacity to communicate. Um, in the book, we focused particularly on uh, communicating in a human language, um, and that's why we had uh, Francine Patterson and uh, Lynn White Miles, and we also had Roger and Deborah Foots. So we had people who were working with uh, use of uh, the human language, human sign language, um, in chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. Um, I thought it was really interesting in the film the uh, uh, interview with uh, about understanding the communication that chimpanzees already have without any uh, intervention with humans. And that's something that would have been very nice to have in the book, but we were not aware of, in fact, that research really wasn't, wasn't occurring at that time. So um, that's, this was another strength of, of the, the argument to include great apes, that if people said, well, um, you know, humans are different because they can reason, talk, self-aware, autonomous, uh, we could say, well, um, they're not the only uh, beings who, uh, of whom that's true, um, and we can certainly see it in, in the other great apes, and we see it to a higher degree than we see it in uh, human infants, for example, and in some intellectually disabled humans as well. So we felt that it was, a, in, in, a way, in a way, a, a, an argument, a, a group of beings who we could defend in a different way and in a way that would shortcut at least some of the arguments that we would otherwise have to go into. So, um, so we did that. Uh, we got the book published in uh, 1993, and uh, we always had the idea that uh, it would be there would be a book, um, there would be a declaration. The book started with the Declaration of Rights for Great Apes, um, and that argued that they should have the rights to life, liberty, and the protection from torture. Um, again, as, as mentioned in the film, uh, we were clearly not arguing that they should have all rights that humans have or the, all rights that adult humans have, like uh, rights to vote or freedom of speech or um, freedom of association. Um, you know, we were simply taking some very basic rights that seemed uh, undeniably important to the great apes that we were talking about. Um, and, you know, just to make clear, if you're wondering why I, as a consequentialist ethicist, was signing on to a Declaration of Rights, um, it's uh, the idea that they should have these rights as positive rights, as something that is socially recognised, uh, ideally that is accepted by the United Nations and that becomes part of international law. Um, so uh, it's not saying that rights are the fundamental basis of the, uh, the claims to moral status, but rather saying um, we want them to be recognised as having certain rights in just the same way as a consequentialist can say we should recognise humans as having certain rights because there will be better consequences uh, for all of them if those rights are recognised. So all of the contributors to the book uh, signed on to the declaration and supported it, so that was the second part of it. Um, we tried to get it more widely recognised and accepted, and uh, you'd have to say that that's one aspect in which we have not really had success um, as yet. Um, maybe we still will, but um, working on that international level seemed to be very difficult. Um, and as I say, the third thing was we wanted it to be an organisation. Um, so we initially set up the Great A Project as uh, an organisation, a, a worldwide organisation with uh, chapters in different countries. 
But um, that too, you could not say was a success, and there were various reasons for that. There were some differences um, between some of the people being involved um, about how to how best to proceed, and we ended up uh, allowing the uh, global organisation effectively to lapse, and instead having chapters in various countries and. Uh, one of the strongest chapters, of course, uh, continuing chapters, has been here in Spain, um, and it's very nice to see uh, uh, Paco Coelho somewhere here in the audience over there. Thank you, um, uh, uh, whose son Alex has made made the film that you saw, um, and uh, uh, and of course Paolo and others in the room I know have played an important part. Um, and it's really exciting to think that now, as a result of that work, and this is you know quite a long time. It's 29 years since the Great A project was first launched, but um, that uh, again there is uh, a prospect of getting a Great Ape law in Spain. I know there was seemed to be a prospect of that um, back in 2013, was it, uh, um, which did not come to fruition. Um, but I'm really hopeful that it uh, that it will this time. Uh, and we have other chapters. We, you saw the interview with Pedro Interian in the film um, in the Great Ape Sanctuary. Uh, in uh, Brazil, near São Paulo, I was able to visit that a few years ago when I was in São Paulo. Uh, so it's very good to see that carrying on. Uh, there's a great ape project in Germany that does some activity about looking at great apes in in zoos in Germany, um, and uh, one in Me Mexico was mentioned uh, earlier this morning. So. Uh, it's, it's still continuing. Um, it's making different levels of progress in, in various places. Um, but uh, you know, looking at it uh, globally, um, I think the Great Ape Project has had an influence um, in various other changes. Uh, we, when, when the Great Ape Project was published, the place where um, the most experiments on chimpanzees or on, on great apes in general, but they were virtually all chimpanzees, I think, uh, was the United States. There were about 3,000 chimpanzees that were then being kept by either the National Institutes of Health or other research institutes in the United States. Um, gradually, uh, that started being questioned and looked at more intensely. Uh, NIH set up a committee to examine it, which had the philosopher uh, David de Grazia on it, and that committee uh, said that there seems to be no medical necessity for doing this research on chimpanzees and it would be better if they were sent to sanctuaries. Um, NIH, as a result of that, decided to send all but 50 of them, to, of, of their chimps, to sanctuaries and they kept that 50 as a kind of reserve, they said, in case there was some urgent need that arose. Um, but then uh, a couple of years later they decided that there wasn't, there'd been no, there were no applications for doing research on those 50. Um, so now we're down to zero, effectively, chimps being held in, in research establishments in the United States. So that's, I think, a, a really big victory for, uh, indirectly anyway, for the, the Great A Project and for the kind of thinking that lies behind it. Um, also in the European Union, uh, when we launched the project, there were chimpanzees being used in research both in the Netherlands and in Austria. Um, those labs have been closed down. Um, uh, and in New Zealand, a, a law was passed saying that you can't do experiments on great apes unless it's for the benefit of preserving the species. Uh, and there have been no experiments on great apes done in, in, in New Zealand. So um, I think that there has been a lot of progress made, um, but obviously there's a lot more to be done. Um, and there's also, as I know Paolo is going to be uh, talking about, um, a lot more science and a lot more information that's been done, uh, a lot more knowledge about the situation. And of course the, uh, the situation that really uh, urgently needs uh, our focus is that of chimpanzees uh, who are free living in their uh, original habitats, whether those are um, chimpanzees in, in particular in, in sub-Saharan Africa and, and gorillas or orangutans in um, Indonesia, uh, that's um, a, a really dire situation which um, I'm sure we would all be working to, to change as much as we can. So I think that's probably um, enough for me and um, I want to hand it over to uh, Paula and, and Macarena to continue and then we'll have some discussion afterwards. 
Thanks very much for your attention. Sorry, I need to sort out the PowerPoint. Is this okay if I stand? No, the sound is not good, no? I have to stand. Okay. I'm reluctant to go to the podium so far away from the, the controls of the, of the PowerPoint. Okay, so see if this moves correctly. Okay, so there's been almost uh, 30 years uh, since the first book, so there were a lot of updates to be made, no? A lot of scientific research that has come out on the great apes. There's been a lot of legal developments. Macarena will speak about uh, some of them. The situation uh, in, in terms of extension is far worse than, than it was, and we also had to reply to many people who thought that the Great Day Project had implications that actually it didn't have on abortion, for example, or on, on Christian souls, or on other issues that uh, we uh, had no intention on commenting when defending the, the apes. Okay. So uh, in 1998, uh, Peter and I came to Barcelona, invited by uh, Manuel Casas from ADA, who couldn't be here today because of COVID as well. And uh, uh, this is exactly when uh, uh, the, the book was translated into Spanish by Trota. And they also asked me to do the introduction for Animal Liberations uh, translation, which also came out in Trota. And since then, um, Alejandro Sierra from Trota has been asking me to, to do this book. And when I published the other one, book in, uh, in Trota, he insisted that, that we finally uh, collected all of these things that have been happening and uh, replied to critics and the advances in the various fronts and, and published uh, this book. Uh, in that trip, we um, went to Madrid as well, where I was friends with uh, Jesus Mosterin, so I introduced him to Peter. Uh, Jesus became the, um, the president of the Great Day Project. Then we had various other presidents, and uh, the few people that was initially there are not in the Great Day Project anymore, except for, for uh, Paco Cuellar, who has always been there doing the, the difficult work of accounting and whatever nobody wanted to do uh, without claiming any credit for himself. Okay, so a uh, few years later, we had the great luck that uh, uh, Pedro Pozas uh, was able to join, and he's a policeman who works for Seprona. So he was able to engage in uh, rescuings of, uh, of apes. This is uh, Sarah, Pedro's daughter, uh, with Kika, one of the few uh, to be uh, the first ones to, uh, to be rescued. And then we found many other uh, apes in extremely bad conditions with a terrible depression in being harassed by children in parks and uh, in very small cages that uh, needed rescuing. And so we started uh, to rescue more and more, which led to more members and more people hearing about it and so on. Uh, we found some really uh, horrific uh, cases. You know, people sometimes remove their teeth so they don't bite. They even might cut their uh, vocal cords so that they, they don't shout because they can shout a lot. Uh, in case of Guillermo, we don't even know why he lost uh, that eye because uh, he was completely isolated for 14 years. Nobody knew anything about uh, Guillermo. And most people think, how is this happening in Spain? How is this possible? There must be a law prohibiting that. that pe people think that because it would be normal. So they think there's no, no need for a great law. But in fact, there isn't a law in Spain that prohibits people from privately owning a chimpanzee and keep it in, in, in their garden. So when we, when we had to uh, rescue them, we had to appeal to anything we could. 
But it was very difficult because, uh, for example, we're told Guillermo was not a domestic animal, so the, the laws dom protecting domestic animals were not uh, applicable to him. You know, if he was a dog, you couldn't keep him always in a cage. You know, even during confinement, the dogs had to come in the street because they need it. But chimpanzees, they live in permanent confinement for maybe 60 years of, the, of their life. Uh, he wasn't a farm animal, he wasn't a laboratory animal, so even the legislation that gives some protection to these animals was not applicable. And even though they are endangered species, he's not native to Spain, so the laws uh, that protect endangered species only protect you if you are an autochthonous species. On the other hand, he wasn't also an alien because he was actually born in, in Canary Island, so he was Spanish, and so the laws that protect, uh, uh, stop the trafficking from other countries were also inapplicable. So in the end, uh, we had to appeal to whatever we could, and we were very lucky that the veterinarian was uh, prepared to sign things that were completely implausible. For example, she claimed uh, Guillermo had to be rescued because he could infect other people with uh, infectious diseases. He had been in complete isolation for 14 years without seeing any, anyone else. How he, was he going to get a, a disease that he could pass on to others? He, she also claimed that uh, maybe Guillermo, who had been unable to break out of his cage for 14 years and his muscles had become debilitated, his health was terrible, he was suddenly going to break the cage and come out and kill someone. One, you know, so it was. We we were in a situation where we had to make claim, claims that we knew were implausible, in this in desperation for trying to do something. And the vets eventually agree. You know, we sign all of this because there's just no other solution. So this is a, a crazy situation to be in that had to be changed. So so that's what we tried to to do. Um, going to Parliament. So. We had uh, three attempts, two with uh, uh, Paco Garrido in, in 2006 and one with uh, John Herrera. And the arguments were so persuasive that, of course, we won. With John Herrera, we won two points by, by uh, complete unanimity. Even the PP voted, uh, you know, agree with, with us on, on various points and uh, by majority in other points. But then Zapatero didn't ratify uh, the agreement, even though it was initiated by his own party. And so we uh, still don't have it. We're still fighting for it. And that's why we are asking you to please sign the petition, because now that the, uh, we have the uh, a change in, in the government and people who are finally making very important uh, legal changes regarding animals in Spain, this summary is our best chance to have the great Ape law. So if you sign the petition that we have at the, at the, at the uh, door, we'll be very grateful, or even better still, if you uh, write a letter and send it to uh, Pedro Pozas to, to support this. One of the things we want to, to do is sort out the situation in Spain so that we liberate time and energy to fight on all the other things that are, are happening, because since COVID, Poaching has increased dramatically, and we have in all of the areas, you know, the, the uh, arm uh, mafias, like the, the charcoal mafias and the coltan mafias in Central Africa are moving into the territories. There's been more killing of the, of the guards and more killing of the, of the apes, uh, more trophies. You know, Ana Mola, who cannot be here today also because of COVID, uh, has been running this campaign against uh, uh, the importation of trophies. And that's another thing. People in despair uh, will sell anything uh, to, to make some money with the a crisis created by COVID. Uh, some people are also um, eating them. Roser was just telling us, uh, me and Peter, that uh, of the Tapanuli, we thought we had 800 Tapanuli um, Orangutans, that's what we say in the book, and it turns out there's only 400 left because the people are, during COVID have eaten so many of them that uh, they have cut the population by, by half. So we need to continue with the uh, education uh, campaigns in all of these countries, uh, sometimes through physical theater to communicate with people who speak other languages, with drawing, showing videos at schools, talking to uh, politicians, sending volunteers there to speak to people about what can be done about it. And so we also have to carry on demonstrating against uh, things like uh, boxing with orangutans in Indonesia and, and Thailand. And of course, uh, the problem with uh, palm oil, which is extremely bad for your health, and so you shouldn't consume it even for self-interest reasons, but it is really uh, the greatest threat of, uh, for the orangutans. They're trying to stop it, as you see, this one is trying. And they can't, so we, we have to help them, or they will become extinct in only a matter of a few years. And the other thing that uh, has become so much worse with COVID that is happening now is that there are species that 
they have in, ha, had conflicts uh, with each other. Probably, uh, as far as we know, from the moment they emerged as separate species. And now we're beginning to see uh, chimpanzee and gorilla wars taking place because the humans are entering their territories. They're leaving them without resources. They need to eat. So they, they, people are beginning to witness uh, uh, wars in the frontiers where they're both so desperate for resources that they are, for the first time, engaging in, in wars uh, with each other. Now, the uh, COVID has been bad for the apes in many ways. One, they are very susceptible to human respiratory diseases, so it affects them directly. If they get infected, it could you know, be one of the deciding uh, factors in pushing them towards the, their extinction, but also because of all these other effects that, that it has had. No? So it's a, created a vicious circle. People engage in wildlife consumption, which we know is the origin of, uh, of the COVID pandemic, caused by diversity law, which we know by diversity protect us from, uh, from pandemics, but also causes this, the, the zoonotic pandemics that lead to poverty and chaos. So people are not in their usual places. The people who normally vigilate, uh, control the poachers are not there. There's disorganization, there's poverty, there's people who lose their job, and so they go into the territories looking for resources or, or looking for the, uh, the apes to... Uh, to kill them and, and sell them. When this uh, leads to the extinction in an area, that area loses a lot of money because they no longer get the photographers, the, the, the uh, uh, documentary makers, the uh, tourists, and all of this uh, money that arrives, as well as the conservation money that they're able to obtain because they have apes. When they no longer have them, they lose that, and so they, they move in, and the other wildlife also disappears. So the, the circle continues, and they have fewer funds and more wildlife consumption. So they, you know, some of them are too poor that to, to stop this. So we need to intervene to stop this virtual circle and a lot of international cooperation and funding is, is needed for this to happen. Now, um, the book. <laughs> so we had some chapters on, on rights, some chapters on personhood, some uh, related to evolution, also some with the legal developments that uh, Macarena will will explain, and also I added a, an appendix with the new things that we know about uh, great tapes as well as the uh, situation on extension. Now, um, I don't have um, a lot of time today, so I'll, I'll say some things about uh, rights, and if I have time, I'll say something about personhood, uh, but mention first three things that I thought uh, we had to say in the book. One is we had to explain the connection with, uh, with human rights because a lot of people were confused by this uh, idea of ape rights and human rights. Some people thought that there was a conflict when in fact it's all the opposite. If you defend uh, ape rights, we're apes as well. So a fortiori, you know, we, you will defend uh, human rights and there is no conflict. Uh, philosophically, there's no problem with uh, talking about human rights for apes, as Paola Cavalieri does, but with the journalist that, uh, in my experience, has proven quite disastrous because it causes a lot of confusion. People don't understand uh, how she means uh, rights in a certain way that she understands from Thomas Poggi and other authors. And so we have um, talked about ape rights or simian rights rather than uh, human rights for apes, which I think has led to, to more confusion. So these things... Uh, had to be clarified, there's no disagreement, it's just a matter of what is the best way uh, of using words so that you don't create confusion with the journalist and, and with the media and give ammunition to your political opponents. The other thing is that some people said, oh, you're only talking about ape rights because you don't understand what rights mean or because you have a peculiar theory of rights that only a few people defend and, and uh, so they thought we were well-meaning but uh, philosophically confused people. So it was important to explain that we understand the theories of rights. We know that there are various theories of rights and we also know and can explain how it, you don't have to commit yourself to any particular controversial or even specific theory of rights in order to defend them. In fact, you can take an ecumenical position and say, you know, if you believe in natural rights, you can always still defend their rights. If you don't believe in them, you think they are conventions, you can also defend them. If you only believe uh, in, in negative rights, uh, you can defend the ones that we are uh, proposing. So there's no conflict with, uh, with any theory. And finally, um, there's the connection between scientific developments and the identification of, of, of rights. And that uh, emerged from the first time that I 
uh, start talking about a rights in the law department of Pompeo Fabra with uh, Lorena, who is probably uh, here, Lorena Ramirez, asking now in a well-meaning way, no? so they play Pacman and what does it follow? So what is the connection between the list of wonderful things that uh, you explain in the initial book that uh, they can do and, and the list of rights that, that you provide. So something more had to be said to fill the gap and explain to people how they are related. So um, I will do that uh, now uh, briefly. How much time do I have? Okay. So well, if, I, if I don't get to talk about personal hoods, okay. Um, so the uh, very bad thing about, about death that uh, justifies uh, believing that they have a right not to be killed is because, uh, first of all, uh, when, if somebody killed you when you live here today, it would be a massive loss for you because you have a long life expectancy and a very interesting life with projects and friends and relations. And so that's another reason why uh, it's extremely bad for these uh, very uh, long-lived animals with very interesting and complex lives. So that's only the, the, uh, the first point. The second one is, of course, there would be people who would be very affected by, by your death. And in some cases, you know, it's even worse for those who stay behind than for, than for those who die. And they have such strong emotions and strong connections that for them, the death of anyone, it is really terrible. After uh, Digit, who was the gorilla friends with Dan Fossey, was killed, uh, they follow the family. The family was not singing, was not clapping for a very long time. And when she asked for an autopsy and claimed the body back, and they came back to find the grave of uh, Digit was empty, they were, the family was in terrible shock. And that uh, sort of state of depression and, and disturbance remained for, for a very long time. So that also affects them peculiarly in a way that doesn't affect all, all animals. Then uh, there's the issue of the connection with uh, your loss. So if we only took the first two into account, we will say that uh, a very early miscarriage is worse than uh, the death of a child because an early embryo has a longer life expectancy, so more ahead of him, more, more potential loss. But uh, there is a connection with the future that the child that already wants to be a doctor or a policeman uh, already has. He's already has plans. He's already been an investment in the child, and the child himself has made an investment for his future. And he is, forms such a deep connection with the future self. We all have you know, things that we do today that are all future-oriented. And the creatures that are very future-oriented lose more when they lose their life because you sever this very deep connection that you have with your future self. In other cases, for example, a shrimp, a shrimp is no more connected to his future self than he is to another shrimp. So it's more difficult in those cases to explain why it is better if a shrimp lives two years than two shrimps live one year each. But in the case of animals that are future-oriented and also have plants, then not only uh, you um, uh, uh, stealing all their future experiences and lives that they could have, but also all the in interest that they have in things that they are going to do in the future. They have plans to go to places, to see friends, to accomplish something, and that makes their, their life uh, more uh, tragic. This is uh, some of the experiment that uh, is very famous with, uh, with humans, the, the marshmallow test. You give them a marshmallow, you tell them, if you wait without eating it, I'll give you more marshmallows, and the children who wait get the reward. So that shows that you know that you are you, and you are also your connected to your future self, and it is in your, inter in your future interest to wait and receive a, a greater reward by delaying gratification. So initially, when this test was made, some people gave it a sort of moralistic uh, turn that uh, there were uh, the ants and the grasshoppers, not the self-sacrificing industrial people who later did well in life and the other ones that ate the marshmallow and, and so on. The experiments with chimpanzees show not only that they are, behave just like children, but also that uh, Thanks to that, we discovered that the most intelligent chimpanzees were the ones that were better at self-knowledge and self-management, so they knew how they would fall into temptation. So smelling it or looking at it or licking it a little bit was a disaster, so that they had to distract themselves with other activities, turn their back, and so on. And so now we know that it's something about innate talent that allows us to resist temptation and get greater rewards in life by being able to, to self-sacrifice and, and delay it. No, and that also shows that they are the kind of person that has this investment in the future and this future orientation that makes life uh, death uh, particularly bad. Uh, 
Uh, other thing is a, lo a lot of experiments uh, with, with painting, which saw a lot of interesting things, such as sort of gender differences being sometimes more obvious than species differences in the, in the painting. But they get very annoyed if uh, they run out of paint or you don't let them complete their painting. So they have projects that they care about their completion. No? Also, when they consider that it's finished, they don't, you can insist, but they don't want to finish. They know this is, for me, a good painting, and I want to stop now and don't touch it anymore. And that matters to them. So they have this sense of accomplishment of, of something that makes you know, life, uh, death particularly bad. Okay, they have, uh, could give you more other examples, but they have a sense of humor. They have a simple uh, humor of, you know, laughing at somebody who sits in his sandwich and stuff like that. But uh, humor and uh, laughter and this is social glue uh, makes also their lives better. So it's one of the many things that I could say that make their lives uh, so valuable and interesting and a terrible tragedy to, to lose. Now, with uh, captivity, there's a lot to say. I mean... They are cultural animals, so they are not born with an instinct to do anything. In fact, they even have to be taught to breastfeed their own babies. And so many babies die in suits because the mothers don't have the training uh, and the education by grandmothers and other relatives that tell them how to be a good mom. So that's why the suits are a factory of, of the, the babies all the time. It's incredible. I mean, the suits hide them, but there are very large numbers of uh, babies that, that die because of that. And because we're cultural animals, we have brains that are designed to be constantly uh, absorbing information and, uh, and gaining um, uh, data. So uh, for them to be in a cage with no stimulation is a complete disaster. It actually causes brain damage that you can see in the MRI um, scans. And they become something that is not uh, a real chimpanzee. No? So if you take a human being, you put in a cage without culture, you, you have something that is maybe homo sapiens, but it's not what we mean by human. The human has to be brought in a community in freedom and with a culture that gets passed uh, from generation to generation. They're also so intensely social that, for, of course, for them, isolation is, is, is so tragic that some of them have actually died from the sadness of, uh, of separation. And they have you know, very long-term memories. So they know I've been here in this cage for all this time. And they know that they had a different life before because, unlike other animals who cannot tell the difference between the pond where they live and the pond where they are captive, they can. They remember that they used to be in the, in the forest with their family doing these other projects. And now somebody kidnapped them and put them in the cage. And they remember the other life, and they can compare it. And that's why they're so furious. I mean, some of the experiments on their capacity for future planning had to do with their gathering projectiles during the whole week, because they know on Sunday that's where the people go to the zoo. And so they want to bombard them, because they are very angry that we put them there just you know, so that we can occasionally go and have a look at them. And uh, uh, of course, uh, apart from the resentment, this, you know, this is like we were talking about uh, the other day. This is like a prison for males and females together, where if you get a bully, you get a rapist, it is going to be in your bedroom for the rest of your life. So for them uh, that are you know, so intensely emotional, uh, for who care about their babies and who they have a baby with uh, enormously, this is a total disaster what, what uh, we're doing to them. So uh, there are various uh, people who have written about uh, this uh, and this difference. For example, uh, Lister Cochrane um, says that animal liberation maybe is not a, a good uh, topic to talk about various other animals because only chimpanzees and certain uh, creatures have this idea of um, uh, imagination and understand the idea of uh, freedom and uh, something separate from uh, welfare. So they might want to stay with their own family and suffer and prefer that to a uh, higher level of welfare that they do not want. No? So for them to follow what they decided is, is important. Now, the study on how abnormal it is uh, resulted in a terrible conclusion that uh, none of the chimpanzees that were part of the study of Birkett and Newton uh, were free from mental illness. They couldn't find a single chimpanzee that didn't have some mental pathology, and they couldn't find any other reason other than confinement. They were well-fed. Some of them were in very big places, but confinement itself leads to uh, mental pathologies in very in intelligent animals. That has led to a wider research where this happens also to orcas and whales and, and elephants. And so this is the, the work of uh, uh, Lori Marino and Bob Jacobs now studying uh, how the different areas that get affected by confinement and how the uh, 
damage that is actually something that you can see, you can visualize how dendrite connections and the parts of the brains that get damaged. And in comparison to the muscular atrophy that you get when you're in a cage without being able to exercise, the muscular atrophy, she said in an interview that I made with her with Methode that is for Cummings, she said that muscular atrophy is nothing compared to the atrophy of a brain that, that uh, we are causing to, uh, to these creatures. So we know that there are some areas that are particularly affected. This is, for example, the area of the brain where we used to read. And we know uh, from the, the first book that uh, they can learn to, to um, communicate uh, or read and write to, to, uh, to some um, extent. Now, uh, with the new uh, uh, developments, um, we know that uh, uh, they already have a much extensive language than uh, we imagine. Uh, a lot of the language that they use is also sign language, so that not to alert uh, predators with, with noise. And, uh, and also people are compiling a great type of dictionary of, uh, of gestures, and so that is you know, indirect evidence of, you know, these very uh, communicative people and very intelligent are going to be suffering a lot when they cannot communicate and when they are um, in, uh, in prison. The other issue is uh, that now we know that uh, uh, because they are cultural creatures, they learn a local language. And uh, so manzana and apple are not the same thing uh, in Spain and, and, and England, it's the same object, but when they are moving around the sources of Europe for reproductive purposes, they arrive into an area where they have to learn the, the local language, which, which they do because they have the capacity for bilingualism or, tri or trilingualism, but it's an additional harm to them, uh, to captivity, that then they suddenly get moved to a different culture with a different uh, system of uh, symbols, different rules, and so on. And the same goes for you know their capacity to understand rules, know how to take turns, and so on. And uh, similar things could be um, said about um, you know how it is so bad for all animals to be tortured. That's like so obvious that maybe that's need an argument. But you know, with very long-term emotional memory, when you get tortured, you become a tortured person, and the uh, brain damage and the trauma that emerges with nightmares at night and uh, persistent. Uh, uh, medical conditions, it is, uh, you know, particularly horrific. Um, well, I was going to mm, just talk about uh, personhood, but I will have to do that very briefly. So after um, um, spending so much time uh, talking about chimpanzees and learning about them, I study a lot because I didn't want to be in a committee or in a debate where with a veterinarian who would catch me not knowing exactly the life expectancy of the male orangutan in the wild or something. So I study a lot. And, uh, and then I, I learned that there were um, a lot of things in common. And that led me to reflect on the con uh, conception of personhood in philosophy. So broadly, there are two views. Some people say personhood is something that they define by one or two features. For example, in Locke's definition, it would be self-awareness and, and mental contiguity or this capacity to imagine yourself uh, elsewhere. Uh, other people think that personhood is a cluster concept like art or democracy or uh, mathematical proof where what you have is a weighted list of traits and none is necessarily sufficient. You just have to have enough of those. No? So maybe uh, some art is not imitation of nature or is not beautiful, but it does something else that uh, makes you, you know, allows you to classify it as art. And so my first uh, finding is that it makes no difference because when you actually look at uh, the candidates, um, this big debate between the two definitions of, uh, or the various definitions of personhood don't actually make uh, much difference in who is going to uh, um, qualify or not. Because the different uh, traits have uh, co-evolved. And uh, my uh, hypothesis is also that this is explained by their uh, reproductive strategy. So I made a list of the weird things that not only chimpanzees, but elephants and, and whales uh, had in common. I was wondering, why is it that whoever has like spindle neurons also has death rituals? And why are, why are they also big, for example? And so I came to, to this view that uh, this is explained by this division in animals between those that have uh, a very large number of offspring and they cannot invest uh, in, uh, in, in them very much because you know, they have so many of them and many of them die when they uh, 
offspring uh, come to, to, into existence, and those who have very few, and they invest massively in them. So these animals uh, that uh, um, all the great apes and all various uh, um, cetaceans, as well as the elephants, fulfill these, uh, these traits. And they typically have very long pregnancies, very long lactation, and very long period of uh, maternal education. The, uh, an elephant, for example, apart from 22 months pregnancy, could be at, at to eight, 16 years of age. It's still learning from the mom the social rules and uh, where places are and uh, lots of things and under the, the mom's guidance and, and protection. All of that massive investment, of course, pays off because they can live to 80 years. So the cultural investment, the technological development, passing on technology onto their children and investing so massively in them leads to uh, you know, a big payoffs because they can live long enough that, uh, that they can... Uh, uh, use all of this culture that, that they learn. So they spend a lot of time nurturing and teaching them. That's also an interesting thing that I found is that technology is mainly female, uh, unlike in humans in all the other species, because they are the moms that master the technology in order to, uh, to teach it to, to their offspring. And they also spend a lot of time, you know, they, they only have one child at a time, uh, orangutans, for example, one every 10 years. So the investment is enormous. And, you know, if you have a baby, they cry, and it's hard to know. Uh, are they cold, hungry, tired, what? And so you have to observe them, and you see them for a long time, looking at them and knowing what they need, which is different to what, what you need. And that's how, I mean, that's, a, I think, the most plausible hypothesis, how you also find that it's these animals that then rescue a bird, and even though they don't fly, they know how to stretch the wings and help the uh, um, the, uh, the animal fly. So this idea of putting yourself in the position of others and understanding uh, the needs of others, as well as you know the empathy and the strong emotions and, uh, and altruism, uh, can be best explained by this uh, uh, relationship uh, of care, as well as uh, in in um, in the human species. Many anthropologists are saying mother is you know, the initial mother language communication is the origin of uh, human language, which in turn led to many cognitive developments in, in the species. So that also explains why, when after this big investment they die, that is a disaster for the mothers, which you know become very depressed. They spend time trying to wake them up. They cannot accept that the baby is dead, so they might carry the baby for weeks. Even even uh, whales and dolphins have been seen for weeks carrying the dead baby. And, uh, and the group understands and slows down because they understand the mother needs to grieve, and they try to distract the mother, and they, they have a lot of death rituals and various things that they try to do to, to cope with this, with this situation. And of course, you know, once you, you have this very strong emotion towards offspring, that spills out, and so it is also in these species that we see very strong uh, interspecies uh, altruism and empathy and desire to sort of look after kittens or members of, of other species. And, you know, we know in the case of, uh, um, I call my son Elian, and Elian Gonzalez, the Cuban, was rescued by, by dolphins. And that's one of the many stories of uh, sort of uh, interspecies altruism. Of course, within them, within whales, for example, we know many whale species look after the, the offspring of, of others. And so that is connected to what uh, um, the Val calls the uh, building blocks of morality, you know, food sharing, uh, consolation, uh, a, a comforting others, trying to reconcile those who have, um, are, are um, in fighting and have gestures for begging for food, for, you know, for need, for come on, go and give somebody some food, and so on, that, uh, that we observe in, in all of them. So that's my, my, uh, my conclusion, is that... Uh, there are um, a number of species. We, we could say that uh, personhood is, or persons are a type of uh, animal that has evolved in the range of species that have very few offspring and care enormously for them. And as a result, they have developed, you know, technology. These things we could call proto morality, you know, uh, and as well as as language. So uh, I was very surprised when uh, Mark Hauser said that. Um, um, the tamarind uh, monkeys have passed the mirror test, which all the great tapes uh, have passed, uh, because they only live 17 years and they are born in twins. So in the species that have twins, you can have that enormous dedication to your uh, single offspring for many, many years of uh, lactation and then um, 
education. And then it turns out that, uh, of course, his uh, uh, research was found uh, to, you know, not to, not to follow the, the proper scientific criteria and led him to a lot of trouble. But it was already all the ones you spend so much time with these other creatures, you, you come to see that there are patterns. And in some cases, it's kind of surprising that somebody makes some claims about other animals. No? So uh, that's my uh, last slide. Uh, in, I have come to see then that there is a, um, a range of species. Of course, the life of all of them can go uh, better or worse. But in some cases, your life can go really, really well. It can actually go disastrous. And I think the great apes are more in this, uh, in this last uh, uh, group of, uh, of species than, than other species for which I also care. But I think the range between a good warm life and a bad warm life is a very limited uh, uh, differences that they can have. While for elephants, 80 years of slavery with you know, nails on your feet you know, is, is just such a horrible uh, disaster that uh, that's, uh, for me, a motivation to, to look after them in particular because uh, the risks uh, for, for being born a member of this species are, are um, are very high. So thank you very much, and, and please sign the petition, or if possible, write the letter to, to Pedro so that we can have the you know, a great blow that we've been fighting for for so many years. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be here participating in Paula Casals and Peter Singer's book presentation. Um, as part of my PhD dissertation, I, will, I have researched around 33 cases on animal legal personhood, and I will share my findings with you today. So um, in this world map, uh, you can see all the countries where there has been a case on animal legal personhood. As you can see, most cases have been filed in Latin America, especially Argentina. Most of the Latin American cases are habeas corpus cases that seek to attribute certain basic rights to a specific animal, such as the right to freedom. These cases have taken place in Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, and Ecuador. As you can imagine, the greatest advances on this topic also belong to, these, to this region. The Pioneer case and the first chimpanzee case uh, were both filed in Brazil. Recently, the Ecuadorian Constitutional Court has recognized all sentient animals as subjects of rights, and this case started because an attorney filed a habeas corpus on behalf of a woolly monkey named Estrellita. Uh, Colombia also has some two habeas corpus cases, both on Andean bears. One uh, called Chucho that became famous and reached the constitutional court. So the law has traditionally uh, understood the legal person as the subject of rights. So it's normal in these types of cases that when judges refer to an animal as a subject of rights, that uh, legal practitioners identify these types of cases as animal personhood cases. In the US, there have been nine cases. Most of them uh, have been filed by the Non-Human Rights Project on behalf of chimpanzees and elephants. Two cases were filed by PETA. One was filed on behalf of the Sea World orcas, uh, arguing, arguing that they, ha they were being held as slaves in violation of the 13th Amendment of the US Constitution. And in another case, completely different, PETA argued that Naruto, the black macaque who took the famous monkey selfie, uh, had the right to copyright. And only legal persons have the right to copyright. Um, then there's another interesting case in the US regarding Pablo Escobar, uh, the drug lord's hippos in Colombia. Um, so they're trying to avoid these hippos from being killed in Colombia. So, um, in the trial in Colombia, they wanted two, two um, experts in wildlife from the U.S. to declare. So the Animal Legal Defense Fund asked a U.S. court to uh, take this declaration in the U.S. And the statute says that 
foreign um, foreign people can ask a U.S. court for assistance when it's about an interested person. So interested persons can ask a U.S. court for assistance for assistance in a case from abroad. So the Animal Legal Defense Fund has argued that this court recognized the hippos as interested persons for the purposes of the, these declarations. We can also see that there are no cases in Spain and only one case in Europe regarding Matthew Pan and Rosie Pan that took place in Austria but was uh, uh, unsuccessful. In this case, the NGO wanted to declare these chimpanzees as legal persons so they could receive a donation. And we can also see that there are some important cases in India and Pakistan. So the pioneer pay, uh, case took place in Brazil in 1972. In this case, a Brazilian NGO filed a habeas corpus on behalf of all imprisoned birds that were sold, hunted, or poached and requested the court to declare the bird's right to freedom. The court rejected the case and said that the habeas corpus could only be filed on behalf of humans. Some scholars in Brazil have interpreted this case as actually a metaphor against the dictatorship of Humberto Alencal Castelo Branco, who ruled Brazil between 1964 and 1985, rather than a case that really seek to free all the imprisoned birds in the country. So after this case, between 2005 and 2010, some habeas corpus were filed in Brazil on behalf of different chimpanzees. The first case was Suiza's, who lived alone in a zoo in Salvador. Two public prosecutors filed a habeas corpus on her behalf, requesting her, the court to order her transfer to a sanctuary in Brazil, the, the sanctuary that we saw in the documentary. The judge, Edmundo Lucio da Cruz, admitted the habeas corpus and granted the governmental agency responsible for, for the zoo 72 hours to present its arguments. Um, the government asked for a 72-hour extension, which the judge granted. And the day the judge was going to decide the case, and everybody kind of knew that he was going to grant the habeas corpus, the zoo informed that Suiza had mysteriously died the day before. So the judge was forced to dismiss the case. But in the ruling, the judge said that he was very surprised to find out about Suiza's death because he had visited the zoo a week before and she didn't seem ill. The thing is that Suiza was killed and nobody ever found out who killed her. So even though this case ended tragically, Suiza's case is very important because it was the first time that a court recognized that an animal could claim uh, his rights in court. And this case opened the debate on animal legal personhood in Brazil and also in Latin America. So since 2013, um, there have been many habeas corpus filed on behalf of different animals in different Argentinian cities. The majority of these habeas corpus were filed on behalf of chimpanzees. But we can also find a habeas corpus on behalf of Arturo, the polar bear, who is internationally known who was internationally known as the saddest animal on earth, who you could also see in the documentary, and on, on behalf of Sandra, the orangutan, who was recognized as a subject of rights by the Federal Cassation Court that is one of the highest courts in the country. The first legally successful case in Argentina took place in 2016 regarding Cecilia. And I say legally successful because um, this case wasn't reversed by a higher court. So I believe that other cases like Sandra's case or even Chucho's case are also su successful in their own way, but uh, unfortunately a higher court did reverse um, those judgments. So in Cecilia's case, she was recognized as a non-human person and a subject of rights and granted the habeas corpus. And she's been living in, a, in the Great Ape Sanctuary in Brazil since April 2017. And this is a photograph of Ce Cecilia the first night she arrived at the sanctuary when it was the first time that she felt grass under her feet. So, uh, well, we all know Sandra. And Sandra became firm, famous because she was the first non-human person. And the media um, published this all over the world. So the importance of Sandra's case is that first we have the habeas corpus. And that case it reached, the, reached the Cassation Court in Argentina, and that court recognized her as a subject of rights. But 
The court did this as an obiter dictum. And this means in law that the court just said this in passing in the ruling. And this, this does not have a binding effect. Um, so in, in short, in this case, the court recognized her as a subject of rights and then sent the case to a competent uh, criminal court. But then the NGO didn't uh, pursue the habeas corpus and filed another type of action that's called amparo in Argentina that seeks to protect other types of fundamental rights that are not protected by the habeas corpus. So that, uh, this amparo case uh, is J Judge Liberatori's case, who you saw in the documentary. And Judge Liberatori recognized Sandra as a non-human person and a subject of rights. But this case was appealed, and the higher court reversed the part of the judgment that recognized Sandra as a subject of rights. However, the case returned to uh, Judge Liberatori, and Sandra was finally transferred to a sanctuary in the U.S., which is the most important thing about these cases, to get these animals out of the zoo. So despite the obiter dictum and despite the reversal in Sandra's case, her, this, her case, the whole case, has influenced courts in Argentina and around the world. So for example, in Argentina, um, several, there, you can find several animal cruelty cases where regarding dogs where the judge has cited the Cassation Court's judgment on Sandra's case to argue that the dog is a non-human person and a subject of rights. For example, uh, you can see in the, pic in the photograph that is Tita. This is a dog who was shot dead by a policeman. And the criminal judge recognized her as a non-human person, a subject of rights, using Sandra's judgment. But the court even went further and said that Tita is the non-human daughter of the human couple who cared for her and uh, identified the plaintiff in the criminal case as Tita's father. So the court in this case recognized interspecies families as well as animal personhood, and all because uh, of Sandra's um, ruling. Sandra's case also inspired, for example, the case a case in Islamabad, when a judge um, decided to close a zoo, the Margazar Zoo, and transfer all the animals to different sanctuaries, including Kavan the elephant who was transfer, transferred to a sanctuary in Cambodia with the help of the singer Cher's uh, Free the Wild Foundation. So after checking all these, examining all these 33 cases, the first thing that pops up is that even though some initially considered them as frivolous or having a low chance of success, um, the number of cases to accord legal personhood to animals have increased in number as well as in the variety of species, the countries involved, and also the ability to reach higher courts. Initially, they were usually dismissed at the lower court level, but now they're reaching the constitutional court or Supreme Courts in Latin America. Initially, there was one case a year and regarding chimpanzees, but now during the last decade, you can find several cases a year and regarding different species, even dogs. As the frequency of these cases has increased, you can also start seeing that judges' attitude has also begun to change. And now there are longer deliberations at higher courts. So courts have started to recognize that they can no longer simply dismiss these cases because the animal isn't human and just say, no, we dismiss the habeas corpus because the animal is not a member of the human species. So courts team have begun to feel like they are forced to deliberate and actually argument why they do not consider the animal as a legal person. So, con so social pressure and even the, the evolution on animal protection has kind of forced judges to get to this point. Another interesting finding is that um, dismissal strictly based on these animals not belonging to the human species isn't the main trend. So in most courts, judges examine legal personhood although you can still find some cases where courts just dismiss them on procedural grounds. The success of these cases then does not mainly depend on the animal species nor on the genetic closeness to humans or even on cognitive abilities. But actually, it's interesting because these cases depend on other things such as strategy, such as the technical aspects of the habeas corpus in that country, the judge's empathy towards animal, the judge's willingness to hear a novel case because sometimes judges aren't empath don't have empathy f towards animals but, but are interested in this new topic of animal rights. 
and even on the general philosophical outlaw, outlook uh, of judges on the law. So if these cases depended on species, strictly on species cognitive abilities or genetic closeness, then chimps would be the most successful species in court. But actually only one chimp case has been successful, which is Cecilia's case. The other successful habeas corpus involved Estrellita, the woolly monkey, recently in Ecuador, and the other habeas corpus that were granted but later reversed involved Sandra the orangutan, who is the great ape that is genetically most distant from humans, and uh, Chucho, the Andean bear in Colombia. And as I mentioned, we can also find now some cases where judges on their own motion recognize dogs as non-human persons and subjects of rights. So, in some of these cases, we see that judges have argued that this petition to recognize animals as legal persons should be made to Congress and not to courts. We all agree, I suppose we all agree, that these cases, their purpose is to make things better for animals and not worse. But we, there is a dilemma when activists have a case, uh, an animal in captivity in, in a case like this. Because a case with a high chance of success could lead to the animal being killed, as occurred in Suiza's case. So the political struggle on a, on a bill on animal legal personhood doesn't face this, this dilemma because a bill wouldn't focus on, a, on an individual animal, but on a species, or, or more than one species. But the thing is that these animals are dying. Some of them die during the lawsuits or a short time after the lawsuits, like, for example, Arturo the polar bear. So these cases are truly urgent because these animals are suffering, suffering greatly from captivity. So in most cases, there's no time to, to start a, um, a political process in Congress. So maybe political, uh, the political pro strategy um, may be ideal in the long term, but maybe not enough to help animals that are currently suffering from the consequences of captivity. So, Mm, the process in Congress isn't only slow, but also it is difficult because a uh, bill on animal personhood it has the problem that all these different types of lobbies will oppose it in Congress. So anim I think that animal activists are kind of forced to seek the, the help from courts, and they do this mainly through the habeas corpus. And um, I, some could say, well, but most of these cases are defeats. So that proves that the um, judicial uh, path for animal legal personhood is not adequate. But actually, we can see that there have been some advances. And now judges, for example, are starting to admit that the habeas corpus can be used to protect animals. So I consider that advocates should continue filing these types of cases in court. Then we have a different type of problem in court is that some courts confuse person and human. And at the same time, uh, some judges are very frightened because of the slippery slope. So instead of focusing on the animal plaintiff, they are worried about the consequences of that particular case on the rest of the activities uh, where humans exploit animals. Uh, however, the habeas corpus is not the only mechanism to argue for an animal's legal personhood. As I told you, criminal law cases uh, have been, judges, criminal judges have started to recognize animal persons as in, in their own motion as a way to stress the great abuse that that animal suffered and to stress how serious the offense was. At the same time, we can see that, um, for example, PETA used the copyright law to argue that an animal had this right as a legal person. And well, we know that, for example, chimpanzees, elephants, um, we could argue that uh, they have copyright because they, ha they make tools, they create works of art, among other things. And another strategy is also to accompany, for example, habeas corpus with administrative procedures that argue, that seek to close the zoo because of the, the violation of animal welfare regulations. So the last finding is that um, initially, all these cases um, were considered to have a low probability of success. And most attorneys can agree that there are some strategies that may have a higher risk of creating a negative legal precedent versus other strategies that maybe don't. So what should animal activists do? 
should they go ahead with these lawsuits that have a low probability of success or should, should they not pursue these types of lawsuits? I think that animal advocates should go ahead with these cases even if they have a low probability of success because they have had beneficial consequences. So for example, fragments of ju uh, judgments that were declared inconsequential or unsuccessful like these obiter dictum declarations can still influence other courts in the country or in other countries, as has happened with Sandra's case. Then, we, animal legal personhood has become increasingly supported by famous philosophers, um, by judges, by attorneys, by scientists. So this shows that these cases are neither frivolous nor ridiculous and starts normalizing the topic among the public. And then the... Um, that the media has helped um, animal legal personhood quite a lot because publishing all these stories on Sandra and Cecilia and Chucho and Estrellita makes uh, the public's growing familiarity with the possibility of, of animal personhood and also identifies and involves the public emotionally with specific animals. So it's different to read a story in the press that talks about orangutan Sandra and Sandra's history and where she came from and what she's suffering, it's different to read that from reading an article on orangutans in general. So this has helped immobilize the public and also courts and governments to act on behalf of these animals. Fi the final example would be Chucho's case that was unsuccessful because the Constitutional Court finally dismissed the habeas corpus. However, now in Colombia, everybody knows who Chucho the Andean bear is. Everybody knows that he's living in this Barranquilla Zoo and everybody is, is, is going to check his conditions at the zoo. And now everybody also knows what's the problem with Andean bears in Colombia and what's happening with them. So this is thanks to media's interest in these types of cases. Um, thanks for your attention and congratulations for the book. <laughs> I know that legal advocates um, for legal personhood would use it for these, all these types of lawsuits. Thank you. Um, if you want to ask uh, some questions, but um, first I want to say something in case um, is. is not clear, I thought Macarena was going to explain it. Um, in law, you can just say, well, I'm going to decide what personhood means. No, There's a lot of uh, options. You can just say whoever has a right uh, is a person and so on. Other people, like uh, Steve Weiss, they want to have a concept of person that coheres with other understandings of personhood in philosophy. And that's why, you know, our work is sort of compatible because we want to be able to, well, if it's a convention, it's very easy, but if people want to make it fit with other ideas, so what you could say in biology or what you can say in philosophy, that's why I was trying to create an idea of, um, so how personhood has evolved that Steve Weiss could use uh, for the cases that, uh, that he's uh, fighting. And the other thing that is uh, wonderful about uh, Macarena's work is that uh, some people initially criticized the Great Day Project uh, as sort of elitist and exclusivist and disregarding the other animals, but uh, it has shown that uh, as a result of the Great Day Project, there are all of these legal developments which are now spilling out you know, benefits for, for all the other animals. So you know, uh, I think this is a very clear uh, case that shows that uh, the intention uh, was not only an intention that wasn't going to work, but it, the intention of starting with the Great Apes, but with you know, an opening to the rest of the, uh, of the species, uh, it is really uh, what has happened with, uh, with the Great Ape Project. So if anyone wants to ask uh, anything? No? Yeah, okay. Diego, Diego gives you a microphone. Hi, yeah. I was wondering if, um, if this uh, uh, could have um, consequences for farm animals and even like potentially negative consequences. I'm, I'm just wondering, I, my guess is probably not, but I'm just thinking if uh, countries like Argentina decide to change laws to be more rigorous about how to treat animals, 
maybe they do it in a way that would clearly separate farm animals from other animals. I'm just wondering if that could be the case. Um, who did you want to? <laughs> um, so for now there are no cases regarding farm animals because well these lawsuits do have like a strategic component to them so that's why usually for example the non-human rights project f focuses on chimpanzees elephants and the problem is with this fear that judges have of the slippery slope so when they receive an animal rights case or an animal legal personhood case judges mm, are show they're, that they're nervous because they say like, oh, if I grant this animal the right to freedom, this means they're going to use this case to free all the chickens that are in a factory farm. So for example, the non-human non -human rights project always tries to di distance themselves and say like, no, we're focused on chimpanzees and, uh, and elephants. But um, as we can see, animal legal personhood is kind of like spilling over to companion animals. And we see this in criminal courts where judges just grab the Sandra case and say like, hey, the dog is also a non-human person. I think that mm, the benefit for farm animals mm, isn't near yet because, well, we're consuming them a lot, <laughs> exploiting them still. So, but I do think that maybe in the future they can, they can, we can use these judgments. For example, the judgment in Ecuador just argued that all sentient animals are subjects of rights. The case was focused on a wild animal that is Estrellita, a woolly monkey. And so the court said that there are different rights that, um, that wild animals have. But in this list of rights that the court gave, there were some rights that also apply to other animals, like farm animals or any other sentient animal. So even though that case was more focused on a monkey, the court is saying that all sentient animals are subjects of rights. So this, this ruling can be used in Ecuador to improve the situation of farm animals, especially considering that, for example, in Ecuador, there's not even an animal welfare law. There's nothing, there's just a criminal law and environmental regulations, but there's not like a general animal welfare regulation or anything. So I think these cases can help. I don't think they will af affect them negatively, but I, I don't see, that somebody will present a habeas corpus on behalf of a pig or anytime soon, all, all, although we have arguments for that because, I don't know, pigs have certain attributes and characteristics that, that could support a case on their behalf. I, um, in the case of uh, Chucho, for example, it was the fear of a uh, similar case uh, uh, regarding the hippopotamus uh, that uh, Pablo Escobar liberated and now have reproduced and they are dangerous. And so some people want to kill them and other people want to defend them. Uh, and so there was uh, some of the interventions in the constitutional court uh, were making people afraid that uh, um, if we defended uh, ch that Chucho was a person, then you know maybe somebody could say that a hippopotamus also could be a person, and then it would be a, a, a really a great problem because uh, sterilization of hippopotamus is very expensive. So um, that was a, the great concern at that time. But I think it is just a matter of time until somebody files an habeas corpus for a cow or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You, 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 um, no, no. Diego, the microphone. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks. Um, it was a wonderful pres presentation. I just have um, two questions addressed to both uh, Peter and Paula, and and they they have to do with the with the argument for a simian right to life. So you you uh, elaborated on your argument now, and I also went over the over the uh, book and it seems it seems that uh, to to follow from from that argument that that only individuals with a strong psychological connection to the uh, future or with um, future oriented desires have an an interest in living or a sufficiently strong interest in living to be protected by a right to life and um uh, 
I was uh, uh, wondering how that could be squared with with um, Peter's um, impersonal hedonistic views uh, about the 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 interests in living. If animals are, if I I had misinterpreted the 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 argument for the grounding of a right to life. Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, I will let Peter talk, but I just very briefly want to say that I was talking about sufficient, not an unnecessary condition, just something that makes it so clearly bad that, uh, you know, the argument is very clear, not that it's going to be a necessary condition. So uh, you understand the difference between necessary and condition. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so you're right that for those that I, I, not everybody will know about this, not everybody's a philosopher in the room, I presume, but um, I used to hold the view that uh, the correct basis of thinking about the interests of beings was in terms of their preferences, and on that basis I argued that beings who were capable of thinking of themselves as existing over time could have preferences for continued living that a being that lived in a more moment-to-moment -moment way could not have, and that was a difference for think that was a reason for thinking that, for example, great apes ha have a right to life as you, uh, normal humans do, that uh, some other animals would not have. Um, I subsequently, a few years ago, changed my views about the correct basis of uh, regarding interests into thinking of it as, as you say, in terms of hedonism. Basically, that means in terms of maximizing the surplus of happiness over misery or pleasure over pain. Um, and so that does mean that the argument that I used to make for saying that beings with self-awareness had a stronger claim to, to life um, don't really go through anymore. So I haven't really written about what the basis now is, but I think it's going to have to be one that is more in terms of um, external factors. Uh, Paola in her presentation talked, for example, about the effect of the loss on others. Um, that's clearly going to be very relevant. Um, and in terms of the loss on the individual, uh, well, there's a, f a couple of things that are relevant there. One is um, normally longer life beings, longer lived beings would have a greater loss, assuming that their lives are going to be positive. Um, and, and that would be a factor. But, of course, if the being is going to be replaced by some other being, then if there is no weight given to preferences for continued life, um, replaceability seems to go through. So um, if another being will only come into existence if one is killed, uh, which arguably is the case for somebody who is producing animals on a farm, and, and let's assume it's a really nice farm where the animals all have good lives, not a factory farm, so that you could say the lives are, are positive, um, then if uh, you say, well, you can't kill these cows, let's say, um, uh, and the farmer says, well, in that case, there will be no more cows because I'm not going to be able to be a farmer if I can't kill the animals. I've got to make some income somewhere. Um, so that argument then does seem to succeed to the extent of saying, OK, well the loss of life to this particular cow is made up for by the positive life that another cow will now have, even if it's going to be a shorter life than the natural lifespan of cows. So, um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm, I might have to accept that um, um, insofar as that loss of life um, then doesn't go through in, in those sort of situations. I don't know whether you have other thoughts on this, Paula? No. Okay, let me just order the conversation. Is there any questions regarding this topic, repressibility, value of life, and so on? Or we are just going to change the topic? Okay, it's fine. Then she was very right. Uh, yes, so I have like a question and also like a comment, also regarding a bit the previous comment. Um, I think also it happens, at least in Colombia, uh, is that when there is one of these cases, but they, uh, let's say, put in risk uh, humans' uh, survival or human interest in some ways, then they, of course, they, I think they are more likely to be successful. 
And this is, for example, the reason why um, probably nobody will in the future, on this, well, at least soon, to claim about the rights of a cow or a pig, because we are still very anthropocentric in our views of, of law and, and, and rights. So they will immediately say that's going to treat uh, the rights of people to work, for example, which is a basic right, or the right people to eat, which is a basic right, like humans' rights. So then, then of course, animals' rights will go below that, and then they will dismiss the cases. And um, that make my comment uh, or question to you is about um, integration of the different sectors in the society uh, for making this uh, successful. So for example, like, like law cannot advance, uh, to me, um, what I see is like cannot advance on its own if the other part of the society are not advancing at the same time, because you uh, can produce like law and rights and, and, and you know, um, yeah, laws, but then the implementation, it's not possible because probably the country have no capacity to, to implement. The society won't accept because they are not educated enough. So it's like education, technology, economy. So it's so many factors to make this, uh, to make um, animals' rights a successful uh, fight. And I see it, uh, for example, um, we have passed pass a law right now in Colombia. Actually, many laws <laughs> have been passing uh, successful for, for, for animals. One of them, uh, the most recent one, is the provision of recreational fishing, uh, which was just a few weeks ago. But then there is a lot of debate because the country is not ready for that because we don't really have a differentiation in the country between recreational fishing and uh, survival fishing, like fishing for, for food. So it's all mixed up in such a way that they could affect communities that actually indeed uh, eat the fish in the end, but they are registered as, 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 as um, recreational. So there is not this societal, uh, the, the society is not ready for sometimes this kind of, um, or for example, let's say when they uh, pass a law that we cannot use uh, animals to, uh, um, uh, yeah, as, as work, to carry material, woods, uh, whatever, that it's still in Colombia happening. So they pass the law and they have all the, the, the country have to rush to uh, move from this type of transportation to something else. But then what is going to be with the, with the horses? There is not sanctuaries, not enough that can absorb all the, all the animals that will be, uh, be not be exploited anymore. But then the society is not ready for it. So that's like a bit of a comment, like what do you think about this? How could you work uh, with the other sectors of society to make the, the animals' rights uh, claims successful? And um, yeah, so I agree with everything you said. I mean, the law is always kind of behind everything else. But for example, we can see since the Great Ape Project came out and animal liberation, that the law, um, for example, if you read these judgments that I mentioned, you can see that judges are now saying in the rulings, like a chimpanzee has the intelligence of a two-year-old or three-year-old. Uh, chimpanzees can do this, uh, orangutans can do this. Like, so we can see that at least science, for example, has some influence in judges through these like expert, for example, expert opinions that uh, through these amicus curiae that experts file in all these types of cases. That helps uh, these cases a lot. So for example, in the recent Ecuador case, that, that's the latest case. <laughs> so in, in this case, um, uh, I worked on the amicus for on one of the amicus for this case with uh, with three other people, and the argument, the problem in this case was, could animals be protected as a subjects of rights under the rights of nature? Because Ecuador has the rights of nature in its constitution. So in our amicus, for example, we argued that individual animals can be protected by the rights of nature. But until now, always the rights of nature and environmental law always focus on species and not on individuals. And the Constitutional Court uh, incorporated that argument in the ruling and said, yes, the rights of nature now protects individual animals. So that, for example, is something maybe small, but that is actually a huge like, step because now, for example, that case was motivated by one woolly monkey, just one woolly monkey. And that activated the whole judicial system up to the Constitutional Court. So now that gives advocates in Ecuador arguments to 
um, further these types of cases, you know? And so we have these small advances. But this has to go together with what you say, education, science. Like, it's very important, I think, for scientists to uh, communicate the results in a very clear way so people can understand, like, oh, okay, so these animals have these capacities or these needs. So that can translate to judges. Um, and yes, uh, m sometimes these cases uh, are hard when, for example, when the cases say like all sentient beings now are subjects of rights, that is very hard to implement right now because there's not, not like an institution, uh, an institutional structure to support it. But a lot of these cases are for individuals and they did change the lives of those individuals and they didn't need much institutional support to do that. Like Cecilia just needed like mon the money and the, like the judgment, and then the money and NG an NGO to help the transfer to Brazil. The same in, in Sandra's case. So when they are they are focused on individuals like great apes or elephants or or bears and or animals like this, they don't, we don't need so much institutional support in these cases. And maybe that's why these are have more chances of success for now because they don't imply like big changes, you know. So that's something that is also like a matter of strategy in these cases to think about. Can, can I just comment or really ask about, uh, I mean, I'm really surprised to, to learn that Columbia passed a law against fishing or recreational fishing because that's pretty astonishing in other countries that I've lived in and it's a very long way from happening. Um, presumably, the law does prohibit catch and release fishing, right? I don't know, maybe that was not practiced in Colombia, I don't know, but it's practiced in many countries where, you know, it's considered a sport to go fishing and you haul this fish up with a hook in its mouth um, and uh, then you release it, maybe you weigh it so that you win a prize for having cooked the hook the big, and then you throw it back. Um, so I guess that's prohibited anyway, is that right? Um, yeah, it's correct. Um, Colombian tradition, uh, constitutional or law tradition, is very uh, vanguardist or very re like they like taking risk when it comes to to these decisions. As you you are the expert, I'm, I'm not. Uh, but for example, uh, we have for example banned uh, testing cosmetics uh, already, and I think next year is the the law will start taking in place. Uh, so we are banned in Colombia. You, we, we cannot test um, animals for co cosmetic uh, products, but we don't test cosmetics in Colombia. Right. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's the same with fishing. Uh, we don't have a big community of people that practice the the catch and re release thing. This is more in the U.S. and other developed countries. Um, of course, it's a very good precedent, and we as animal defenders are really happy about this. Uh, but it has it's causing right now a lot of debate w within the country because people is wondering what what is really what is recreational fishing. People don't don't even know where is it, and it really goes uh, mixed up with the other many types of fishing we have, which are subs uh, subs uh, subs. Um, yeah, so, uh, for for uh, sustenance. Yeah. yeah, for sustenance. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we are very very risk takers when it comes to to passing laws. And Thank you. Well, you know, Peter is another example that uh, for so many years we always look at uh, vegetarianism as an Anglo thing, but now the revolution is happening in Spanish. It's all of these uh, developments all around Latin America. They're really taking the lead uh, globally the Latin Americans now, yeah. Uh, Diego, there was somebody here at the front. Thank you. Um, you have explained cases in which habeas corpus has been like implemented or tried in order to um, protect wild non-human animals against anthropogenic harms. But have there been any cases or cases that um, get close to protecting non-human animals from natural harms using habeas corpus? Um, no, I think of the 33 cases, uh, all the habeas corpus cases seek to protect uh, an animal that's been, that is being held captive by humans in zoos and labs and circuses. Um, 
yeah, basically the habeas corpus is used for those types of cases for now. Okay, yeah. thank you. So I want to ask a question about, because we focused a lot on great apes in captivity, and then Paula, you mentioned the bonobo and like, are suffering from deforestation and dying. And I wonder how the great ape project and all this work also applies to preventing great apes from dying out of like, uh, non-direct human action. Because there seems to be some kind of difference between our duty not to directly harm a chimpanzee and then our duty not to cut out all the forests and thereby preventing chimpanzees from living in the wild. So it's a very clear question. I'm wondering how the work and how all this also applies to habitat conservation. Uh, well, I think when we uh, conceived the Great Ape Project, we certainly did want it to protect uh, free living great apes. Uh, I think that's, uh, from memory, that's somewhere in the original book in the Declaration or perhaps in the uh, pro epilogue that Paolo Cavalieri and I wrote, I'm, I'm not sure, but, but it, it certainly was the intention. We were aware of the risk, we were aware of the fact that um, great apes were being killed to be eaten um, and we did think that it was important to stop that and we didn't really draw any sharp distinction um, between trying to stop that and trying to uh, protect apes in uh, captivity, you know, being used for experiments or whatever else that might be. Uh, deforestation, I suppose, is you know somewhat less direct, but um, certainly roads being put into forests for um, purposes of logging um, opened up uh, areas to people going in to kill the great apes for food, um, which hadn't been before, and we were already concerned about that aspect of it anyway. Uh, but Arthur, were you asking also about the difference between? Uh helping them when they are being attacked by humans or helping them when they are being, you know, another, ape another ape, for example, as in the case that I mentioned about the beginning of the chimpanzee gorilla wars. Yes. Well, it's a difference in how direct it is, like shooting them directly or, or uh, you know, destroying the, their habitat so that they die in larger numbers. Or w what is your question about this? Yeah, yeah, uh, oh, okay. I, I just remembered a case that I ha had forgotten. In Argentina, we, well, last year, Greenpeace filed uh, an amparo, that um, a constitutional action that seeks to protect other fundamental rights that are not protected by the habeas corpus. And they filed this on behalf of all the jaguar species with the argument that um, their, the Gran Chaco, that's the forest at, like the jungle, like, yeah, the forest at the north of Argentina where the jaguar lives is being destroyed because the um, a frontier for farming and for the soy plantations has extended and it's, and is eating up the jungle. So that is, killing the, or driving the jaguars to extinction. So that case now is in the Supreme Court, and they're trying to argue that the jaguars are recognized as subjects of rights to protect their own habitats. Hi. I, I, the term personhood has played a big role in um, both of the sessions, I found it fascinating, but I'm, I feel like a bit of a backward student because I'm not completely clear about what people mean by personhood or how fundamental they think the idea is in determining uh, how we should treat other creatures. Right? So um, 
So I just wanted to describe three positions and ask you whether these represent your positions. So I thought Macarena had the idea of a, a personhood as just, as Paula suggested, legal personhood. So a person is just an entity that possesses certain legal rights, or perhaps legal rights which are connected with habeas corpus. So that, that's just a, a construct created by a legal system. And then I thought both Peter and Paula had an idea of personhood based on the psychological capacities of a certain type of entity or animal. But I wasn't clear about how fundamental they thought the idea of personhood was, morally speaking. Right? So you might think what fundamentally matters is whether an entity has a capacity for welfare, has a good. And there are some entities which are persons and some entities which are non-persons. But fundamentally, how, the, how we should treat these entities just depends upon their capacity for welfare. And whether they're a person may influence how much welfare or what forms of welfare they can enjoy. But fundamentally, what matters is whether they're a vessel into which you can pour welfare. But I think that's Peter's view, and I just want to hear whether he, he's going to confirm that. Uh, I, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, can I, can I oh, just describe the triad? Because yeah. I, I'm trying to see whether the co-authors share this view. But um, be brief, <laughs> but because I think be we're going to have to then. leave the room very soon. OK. In that case, do you, Paula, do you think what matters fundamentally is whether a creature is a person and if it's a person, we should care about its welfare. Perhaps there are other reasons to care about welfare. Of course. As well. Of course. But you might have a kind of less comprehensive view than Peter has. Sorry for being long-winded. Uh, no, no, she, so you, I think that was then more directed at you. At um, first I thought it was directed at me, but... Um, well, yeah. uh, you think that uh, the concept of <laughs> moral status uh, is uh, essential for ethics. I think it, it belongs to this group of philosophical clutter that we would be, you know, uh, better off without, like like Oscar uh, thinks. Uh, and in the case of personhood, yes, I think in, it, if people already had the correct attitude towards animals, maybe we could dispense with with the word uh, person, and uh, just talk directly about uh, some individuals have certain interest, and everything I said about how it is so bad to be killed or, or be uh, confined and so on, when you have um, certain uh, traits, will still apply without um, having to employ the, the word person. But uh, there are two reasons to, um, to uh, or at least two reasons to continue to employ it. One is that uh, a lot of people have uh, re employed the word person against us. No? They're not persons. So they don't have rights uh, in the law, but also not in philosophy. Or, you know, they, there are lots of arguments like that. And so you can say, well, you know, can, you, can say, you can argue in other ways, but one possibility is to say, yes, they are. You know, because look, you know, I have, I, I, I can show that I have scientific evidence to show that they satisfy every definition of personhood that has been given by this philosopher, this philosopher, this philosopher, and so on, in, and of course with the cluster definitions of personhood. So you can, you can use this legitimate, and it also sort of captures our moral imagination in a way it sort of very quickly condenses uh, various views on the capacities of these creatures and the things that are really bad for them. So it is a useful term, like the word rights. You know, maybe we could do without it, but you know, it is extremely good uh, to, to have, and I will continue to use it. Um, yeah, I think all I need to say is, like a, a, a judge, I, I concur with the opinion my learned <laughs> colleague has just expressed. I, I think you put it very well. Uh, 
Hi. Uh, one, one, one question to Paula, and well, if you know, uh, if um, do you know if there are many great apes or chimpanzees as companion animals in in Spain, like the, if they are in private hands, and because if there are, there there are, I think we can do something about it because uh, at least from the if you apply the 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 criminal code in Spain, they are covered by by that article uh, since they live under the the protection or temporary or permanent protection of humans. They are covered by by that article as well. So maybe it's something we can we can work. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know. well, there were more. I mean, we have been rescued them. So the 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 problem is sometimes we don't even know that they are there. No, they are in somebody's garden. And uh, Guillermo, for example, we only heard because somebody walked in the street, heard the, the shouting, and so alerted the Great Day Project. And so we investigated. But you know, somebody with a larger garden would be able to 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 keep them uh, confined. But uh, uh, the um, uh, laws have, uh, you know, thankfully uh, changed in Spain. They are becoming better. And the, uh, one uh, key feature is the understanding of what domestic means. No? That uh, now, you know, it has a more expansive uh, definition uh, in the last uh, two revisions of the, of the criminal code. So uh, now it, would, it should be uh, easier for us to claim that in some sense it's domestic because it lives, uh, it depends... Uh, for f food on somebody who keeps him trapped in a particular place, and so we could now maybe make that case. We need to close, no? I, th mm -hmm. I thought we didn't have the room for, for any longer, no? So should I, should I ask the technician? Well, Nuria would know, no? Oh, I thought we, we had to finish now. No? I thought it, the room had been reserved for a, another event and they wanted to uh, uh, clear by now. Or Okay. So, shall we take one final question or so? Excuse me. If there is one. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe the, the questions have been put off by this uh, need to vacate uh, quickly. Okay. Well, um, I just wanted to, to uh, thank Peter uh, very much for for coming and uh, for all the work that he has done over the years. And, uh, and also I'm very proud of... Uh, the greatest uh, expert on habeas corpuses in the world, I think <laughs> she is now, uh, who is, uh, we're losing her, she's going to Harvard, but uh, we'll continue to do excellent work on animals there. Thank you very much. There's a coming. question on, on Zoom. Ah, okay. <laughs> but uh, I think it's regarding the first question, Pablo's question. So uh, Francisco Javier Izquierdo Núñez asks, kind of similar here in Spain with the new Ley de Bienestar Animal, right? Considering some non-human animals but not farmed animals and having trouble with domestic animals like dogs who are used to hunt too. Even when they are from the same species, they have different conditions. Well, it's not a question. <laughs> no. And I don't know what is he referring to. So I didn't understand it. If, if Franci Francisco, if, if you can clarify your, your question in the next 30 seconds. <laughs> and... I understood as a comment rather than a question, wasn't it? Yeah, but um, he says kind of similar here in Spain with the new Ley de uh, Bienestar Animal, right? So the he says, he says, now people are worried that it could spill over? Was that it's relating to the question about whether, the question about Argentina, about whether things could spill over from... Yeah, that, yeah. referring to that. But he says, uh, it was a comment. Mm. It's fine like this, thank you. Okay. So I think that's all. <laughs> Good. Okay, well, thank you very much to everyone thank for coming. You. Thanks for coming.